In the summer 1994 issue of the Heritage Foundation's Policy Review, then Representative Dick Armey, who was now the head of Freedom Works, had this to say as a tribute to his intellectual mentor, Dr. Friedrich von Hayek, on the 50th anniversary of the publication of Hayek's well-known work, The Road to Serfdom. Liberation is at hand. A paradigm-shattering revolution has just taken place. In the signal events of the 1980s, from the collapse of communism to the Reagan economic boom to the rise of the computer, the idea of economic freedom has been overwhelmingly vindicated. The intellectual foundation of statism has turned to dust. This revolution has been so sudden and sweeping that few in Washington have yet grasped its full meaning. But when the true significance of the 1980s freedom revolution sinks in, politics, culture, indeed the entire human outlook, will change. Once this shift takes place, by 1996 I predict, we will be able to advance a true Hayekian agenda, including radical spending cuts, the end of the public school monopoly, a free market health care system, and the elimination of the family-destroying welfare dole. Unlike 1944, history is now on the side of freedom. Today, Dick Army heads the group Freedom Works, which is a grouping of billionaires who funded large parts of the Tea Party revolution and co-opted the mass strike into voting in fascists like Rand Paul. They are obsessed with cutting, cutting the budget, cutting the government, cutting health care. But it isn't just a fetish for cutting. The inspiration behind it is the destruction of the nation state. We take the case of California not as the only example, but as an example which highlights this attack. Mr. Schwarzenegger has just announced a special emergency session of the California legislature to deal with the new crisis in the state's 2011-2012 budget, which will begin on December 6. He explains that while California's economy appears to be showing signs of stabilizing, our job creation and revenues are still lagging. Arnold has said the same thing each year since he was elected because the state has had budget emergencies since he came in. California, which used to lead the country with their public education system, infrastructure, technology, and agriculture, is now leading the way into the complete unraveling of the United States economy. It is important to keep in mind that all of Schwarzenegger's cuts are aimed directly at the protection that the government offers the population. He targets the poor, the elderly, and children, all the while claiming that while these cuts hurt, they are necessary to stop the suffering of the private sector and to keep the state's credit rating protected. So he is stealing from the people and turning California into a feudal hell in order to ameliorate financial claims on the market. Let's take a look at some of the details. First, all government employees except forestry and highway patrol must take three unpaid days of leave a month. This is extended indefinitely until the budget is balanced. That is three days out of an average of, of possible 20 work days a month. That amounts to a 15% pay cut in monthly salary. This will drive people out of the state who cannot afford to live there anymore. Charlotte Gallier has worked for the DMV for nearly 20 years and she doesn't necessarily have anywhere else to go, but she knows that she can't stay in California anymore. My reaction is because of the pay cuts and time off, I'm actually retiring now. I wasn't going to leave the state this early, but now I am. It's not fair. I've been here for almost 19 years. Secondly, the budgets of the cities, towns, and municipalities is at the level of austerity. There has already been a wave of city employee layoffs, namely police and firefighters. In Oakland, a city which is already characterized by a certain amount of violence, the police department has issued a list of 44 criminal situations that officers no longer respond to because they lack personnel. They include grand theft, burglary, vehicle collision, identity theft, and vandalism. 
The police chief says that if you live in Oakland and one of the above happens to you, you need to let the police know online. So the police department is going from being an instrument used to prevent crime into a place for cataloging the crimes already committed. The third aspect of this austerity are the cuts to the developmental programs. Just for starters, there was a $37.5 million cut from the in-home supportive services program, $50 million from the early start program for developmentally disabled children, over $6 million in cuts from programs for the aging, $80 million from child welfare programs, $61 million in county funding to administer California's medical service, Medi-Cal, $52 million from AIDS prevention and treatment, and lastly, $50 million to the Healthy Families Programs, a program for low-cost health insurance for poor children. Now, in the animal kingdom, the physically weak are often left to die so that the herd or the pack isn't held back. But with humans, it's a different story, or it used to be. The human mind is able to govern more of the personality than any individual sense or any combination of senses. People are often able to overcome their physical disability. They often go on to be productive and happy members of society. They are then able to use the insight gained from their struggle personally to help make breakthroughs that will be useful to others in overcoming the same issues or even more universal problems. This basic human capability is going to be destroyed as one effect of these cuts. Lastly, take the case of the California employee pensions where employees who have worked for decades are about to see their pension cut completely. These people are at retirement age, meaning they can't exactly go out and find new work. And as they get older, their medical costs are going to go up. They have given a better part of their lives in service to, the, to helping the state function. And now Schwarzenegger is arguing that the state cannot afford to pay them. The public debt, just for government employee benefits, has grown so large that it is threatening to crush our private sector. The truth is, this isn't really about the virtue of the private sector or the public sector. Everyone is going to lose out on their health care, their protection offered by policemen and firemen, and the shutdown of the government generally. The argument of private versus public is like pitting two teams against each other in a fake fight so that neither one is looking where they should be. Let's take a step back to put some of this into perspective. Like Rand Paul, Arnold Schwarzenegger is no evil genius, and in this case, he is merely the man bot who carries out orders. LaRouche made this point exactly during, back in 2003 during our intervention into the recall election. He identified the group behind Schwarzenegger, headed up by George Shultz and Warren Buffett, using the Hollywood popularity of a Schwarzenegger to burglarize the state. And in Shultz's case, this isn't his first time. In 1973, two years after the Bretton Woods system was taken down, the Nixon administration backed a military coup in Chile that brutally murdered the then president Salvador Allende. Over the next decade, Chile was turned into a laboratory of the Chicago Boys. We'll come back to them in a moment. In Chile, the labor movement was crushed. Wages were driven down by 70 percent, and by the end of the 1970s, the country was bankrupt. Also, the puppet Augusto Pinochet was installed as dictator. Pinochet's Minister of Labor and Social Security, Jose Piñera, devised a plan to privatize the government pension system. Under privatization, pension funds were diverted to private accounts managed by banks and brokerage houses that pilfered outrageous management fees and left most workers with a pittance of their retirement. At the same time, under the dictatorship, at least 30,000 Chileans were disappeared kidnapped and executed by Chile's secret police and by allied right-wing regimes all over South America. This is what the Secretary of Treasury, Schultz, 
had to say about the process. The armed forces took over and no doubt did some unnecessarily brutal things in the process. But nevertheless, they took over. There were in Chile some people who came to be called Chicago boys. They had studied economics at the University of Chicago. And so a Chicago school-like economy gradually evolved in Chile. It worked. It didn't really work. The methods used to destroy the Chilean government are the same ones that are being used in California today and will have similar, if not worse, effects. The essence of the Chicago School of Economics is what is more broadly known as the Austrian School of Economics, founded by Karl Menger. His protégés include the two men, Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich August von Hayek. Von Hayek authored the book The Road to Serfdom, published in 1944, as an attack on centralized government. The philosophy that Hayek and the Austrian school economists adhere to is not new. They say that man as a species does not and cannot know the real nature of things. Therefore, the market should dominate, and the market should not have to depend on a good man or a good government of men to come along to regulate it. The market can regulate itself. Then they argue that there really is no good reason left for a strong government at all. As you can imagine, in 1944, they had the successful reforms of Franklin Roosevelt ringing in their ears. But earlier in 1931, von Hayek accepted an invitation to London to deliver a series of lectures at the London School of Economics. He eventually accepted a full-time teaching job at the school, and in 1938, he initiated an organization that would evolve into the Mont Pelerin Society. Included in this was Frank Knight and Henry Simons, men who would personally teach Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago, Walter Lippmann, Karl Popper, and Ludwig von Mises, and Sir John Clapham, a senior official of the Bank of England who also later became the president of the British Royal Society. At von Hayek's initiative, the Mont Pelerin Society was begun in 1947, three years after the release of his book. The mission of the society was to develop the ideas that he presents. The other founders of Mont Pelerin were men of very old imperial families, such as Otto von Habsburg, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, and Max von Ton und Taxis, the Bavaria-based head of the 400-year-old Venetian Ton und Taxis family. The sister organization to Mont Pelerin was the Pan-European Union. Founded in 1923, the concept of a Pan-European Federation was to spread out and enact von Hayek's scheme to do away with the nation-state entirely and replace it with a so-called benign feudalist system. If this makes you think of the currently disintegrating European Union, you are starting to get the picture. But this federation was far from benign. The first person to join the Pan-European Union was Hjalmar Schacht, who not coincidentally served as Hitler's finance minister and was the actual author of Hitler's slave labor programs. In 1943, the founder, Kudenhof Kalergi, noted with pride the role that his organization was playing. Haushofer and Schacht did and probably still do everything to convince Hitler of the necessity of creating some kind of European Federation under German hegemony. At the same time, Pan-Europa enjoyed the active backing of the British Winston Churchill. Obviously, the fact that Winston Churchill was an advocate of Pan-Europa is particularly significant. Following the defeat of Hitler and the further collapse of the Habsburg Empire, Churchill, as the official head of the British Empire, became the leading post-war promoter of the Austrian school. In the post-World War II United States, the Mont Pelerin Society and its collaborators have continued their old mission to take apart the power of government, most recently through such tools as Rand Paul. Look at the creation of the United States. The idea that government implemented with a specific intention of the benefit of the population was entirely new, and also the Hamiltonian system of economics that was to back this intention up, later named the American system of economy. 
With these two distinguishing characteristics, the United States stood out like a sore thumb in a world that was otherwise controlled by empire and the monetarist system that accompanies empire. The United States went on to become the most powerful entity in the world. This is because the government was not some dead parliamentary system that meets but does nothing. The government was an instrument that brought the population to higher and higher platforms of development in every area. It accomplished this through the promotion of science. When a scientific discovery was made, the government sees to it that it can be turned into technology and spread for the benefit of the people. This is the role of government which is being targeted for destruction today in California and by Rand Paul at the federal level. If the people of the United States allow their government to be lost, there is no place in the world that will be able to replace it.